Hi, and welcome to Maker Fun, powered by Brilliant Labs. I'm Nelly, and I'm so glad you could join us today. Welcome to an episode all about space. We're going to get creative with constellations, nebulas, or nebulae, and how stars are made. We'll join Lauren to have fun with gravity, and we'll get our knowledge on with Gracie and her eclipse. Do you ever look up at night? Does it ever make you feel small? Does it make you feel the turning of the earth? My favorite part about looking up into the sky is seeing a crescent moon. It reminds me that it's a big sphere up there. And that reminds me that we're on a big sphere down here and everything spheres all over the place. It makes me feel small, but connected with everything in the universe. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to experience zero gravity? I'm going to show you an experiment you can try at home to explain what looks like zero gravity. All you need for this is a cup, scissors, and water. To prep this experiment, you're going to take your plastic cup and poke holes around the bottom. I'm using nail scissors to poke the holes because they're sharp, but small and easy to control. To do the experiment, you're going to fill the cup with water, hold it up, and drop it. While the cup falls, watch what happens and see how it's different from when it was held still. The water will get messy, so I recommend doing the experiment outside or over a container that can catch the water. I tried this experiment outside with a 2 liter pop bottle that I cut the top off so you could see it easier. While I hold it up, you can see the water flow freely from the holes in the bottom. But watch what happens when I drop it. Let's slow that down a bit. Look carefully at the holes. Do you notice that as it's falling, no water is coming out? If we ignore the fact that the bottle is falling, you could think that there's no gravity acting on the water because it's not falling out of the holes like it was before. But really, it's just because the water is already falling with the cup. So what does this have to do with space? Well, space stations in orbit are held that way by gravity. So everything in it and the space station are always being pulled towards Earth or falling, just like our water cup. So, like the water cup, if you ignore the fact that it's falling, it seems like there's no gravity acting on the things inside. But really, it's just because everything inside and the space station itself are all falling together, just like the water inside of the cup. And now let's go to Gracie for some new perspective on the phases of the moon. Gracie here again. Ever wonder why we, when we look up at the moon during different times of the month, it looks different? Sometimes it looks like a banana, sometimes it looks like a half a circle, and other times it looks like a big round ball. We call this the phases of the moon. This all has to do with how the earth, the moon, and the sun interact with each other in outer space. We are going to do an experiment together that explains this a little bit better. You're going to need four things. A flashlight, a white foam ball, a pencil, and a dark room or outdoors at night. In this demonstration, the flashlight is of course going to represent the sun, the foam ball is going to be the moon, and your head is going to be the earth. To start off with, place the flashlight at one end of your dark room or at a certain angle outside and turn it on to represent the sun in the center of our solar system. Now stand back a few feet from the flashlight and imagine your head is the earth. Hold the moon in front of your face at arm's length. We all know that the moon orbits the earth, so I'm going to have the foam ball or the moon orbit around the earth in my head. Notice that wherever the moon is, half of it is always lit up by the sun. But when the moon is in between the earth and the sun like this, I can't see any of the lit up part of the moon from my perspective. This is because the part that is lit up is facing away from me. If you look from my angle, you can see things a bit better. We call this the new moon. When the moon is in this phase, we can't see it at all. Now as the moon orbits the earth, we can see that a little bit of light is starting to show up along the edge. We call this a crescent moon. As we keep going, we can see more and more of the light on the surface facing us. 
We can get to this phase where half of the side facing us is lit up. We call this the first quarter moon. After this, we get to a phase where almost all of the circle of the moon is lit up. We call this the gibbous moon. And when the moon is on the opposite side of the earth than the sun, we can see that the whole circle of the moon is lit up. We call this the full moon. As the moon continues to orbit, we start to see less and less of the lighted side and the shadow begins to show up on the opposite side as before. We can see another gibbous, the last quarter moon, another crescent, and then we finally return to the new moon. It takes about a month for the moon to orbit the Earth. So when you look up at the moon today, you know that you will see the same phase again in about a month from now. Because the moon is so close to us, you don't even need a telescope to study it. You can use a pair of binoculars or your eyes without any extra stuff. The next time you are outside, look up and observe the moon and what phase it's in that day. Maybe you can journal what you see and keep track of how the moon phases change over the course of a month. If so, you can share it with us. Thanks everyone for joining me. Happy moon gazing and don't forget to stay brilliant. Here's Bram with a design idea for taking care of space junk. Hi, my name is Bram, and as you may know, we have a building problem with space junk. If the problem keeps up, then rockets won't be able to leave because of all this, well, space junk flying around, and it could disable satellites, which many of us depend on. If one tiny pea-sized piece of metal hits a satellite, that satellite will be destroyed. And then that one will turn into thousands of miniature pieces of metal. Each one of them could destroy another satellite. And it could create a chain reaction that destroys all of the satellites and makes it impossible for rockets to leave without being hit with hundreds of tiny things that could completely destroy it. Normally, a small piece of metal would not be able to destroy a satellite. However, when they are in orbit, they're going at thousands of miles an hour, fast enough to destroy satellites easily, and even rockets. So I designed a another satellite that is meant for getting rid of space junk. Here it is. So, the center part is a magnet, and it will attract all metal junk towards it. Around it is a solar panel so that I can collect the energy to power the scanners. The scanners will see any space junk that comes toward it. If it's very large, then it will hit it with the harpoons on the side, throw it somewhere else where it won't be a problem. If it's small pieces where the harpoon can't hit it, then, the, then we'll just destroy it with a laser. However, if the junk comes in a place where a harpoon or a laser is not pointing, we can use the thrusters to change the direction that they are pointing in order to face the junk. Should I say, as you may know? <laughs> Hi. <laughs>
For millions of years, we have looked up at the stars and wondered, what are they? What do they mean? Do they have an impact on our lives? People are natural storytellers. We tell stories about where we came from, what was here before us, and what is beyond our reach. We see stars at night and we connect the dots, creating pictures with our imagination to play characters in our stories. Stella is an ancient word for stars, and these pictures are called constellations. When I see a seemingly random configuration of stars, my imagination goes to work. How can I connect these dots? What does the shape remind me of? I pick out the brightest stars and start to visualize lines and shapes. Once I have a picture in my mind, I like to make up a story to go with it. This is the great ancient snail of the galaxy and her slime forms the Milky Way. Maybe that's why the stars seem to wheel across the sky so slowly. Gently tap the brush against your finger to create a new pattern of stars. Pick out the brightest stars, the biggest dots that you can see. Decide which ones would shine the brightest in your night sky. When you've done that, connect the dots and see what your imagination comes up with. The way I connect the dots, and the way you connect the dots, might not be the same at all. And that says something about our imaginations. We're all creative in different ways. I hope you try this at home. It just takes a little bit of paint, a little bit of imagination, and you can reach the stars. You can join Luann as she makes a constellation mobile from things in her backyard.
Rachel is going to use quilling to make a picture of a planet.
Does anyone else remember having glow-in-the-dark star stickers on their ceiling? That's my childhood. I could go on and on about all the sciencey wonders about space and about how space inspires us to get creative. Show us your inspirations. Find Brilliant Labs on all our social media or even send it to us through snail mail. All the information's at brilliantlabs.ca. We want to see what you're up to. Thanks to everybody who was in this episode, in front of the camera or behind it, and for all our supporters. But most especially, thanks to you. Stay brilliant. We'll see you next time.